This is the first of our webinar series here at Camera West. We wanted to have a, uh, a new way to con connect with all of you and, and uh, show some cool cameras and whatnot, chat a little bit about uh, some interesting things in the store. Uh, we are, of course, closed uh, to the public due to the whole uh, COVID-19 thing, but uh, we are uh, there are a couple of us here still working uh, and uh, putting some new things up on our on our websites and holding these webinars. So um, we're just going to start out here uh, with Sean. Sean Craner, of course, if you don't know, I'm sure most of you do, is the president and CEO of uh, Camera West and Leica Store San Francisco. Uh, Sean is probably uh, one of the most knowledgeable people, at least when it comes to uh, my understanding of Leica. Uh, he seems to know a little bit of uh, uh, intricate details of Leica history that uh, none of us uh, ordinary people uh, tend to know. So we, he's brought some interesting things here today to share with us and hopefully we all uh, learn something new. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Sean. And then uh, if you have the chat open, uh, you can go ahead and submit some, some questions there. Once Sean's done with his uh, presentation, uh, we'll open it up for some question and answer time and uh, go on from there. So over to you, Sean. Hi, everybody. I'm Sean Craner. Uh, my wife and I found Camera West back in 2000. And uh, like a story at San Francisco, or I think we started that in 2012 and opened up in 2014. But um, we've been like a uh, enthusiast for quite some time, uh, even beyond what uh, what we've been doing in Camera West. And uh, we've been very fortunate to be plugged in and, and acquire some interesting pieces along the way. And I've got a couple of those pieces to share with you today. Uh, First thing I want to talk about today is this Leica M2. Um, M2's always been one of my favorite film bodies. Um, you know, everyone, everyone gives all the publicity to the M3. It was the first uh, Abena and Mount Leica from, uh, from the early 50s, 1954. And uh, the M2 uh, incorporated the 35 millimeter frame lines and just a little bit, uh, a little bit simplified design over the, uh, over the M3. But this particular M2 was owned by a magnet photographer, Paul Fusco. Um, if you don't know who Paul Fusco is, give him a quick Google. Um, get a book here from Paul. This was the, uh, the uh, Kennedy funeral train that he did back in 68. And uh, we acquired this, uh, this camera from, from Paul's niece uh, some time ago. So it's been in our uh, archives for quite a while. We've had it on display in the San Francisco store. Uh, but uh, according to Paul, this camera was used on the uh, on the funeral train project. Uh, so it's got uh, it's got a lot of history. And as you can see, this camera is really it's really been used. A lot of the vulcanites peeled off of it. Um, you can see this or not, but where the vulcanite's missing, uh, there's where through where the glue used to be at right down to the bare metal and the bare metal is even a little bit worn. Um, coming around here to the other side, you can also see where his hands were at. It was just, this vulcanite's just, just worn down and worn off in places. Um, neat thing about this particular camera, uh, this camera is an early M2. It was made in 58. Uh, the, the Kennedy funeral train uh, program uh, was done in 68. Uh, this is a second printing of the book, so it's a relatively modern uh, copy of the book. Uh, it is available from our uh, store in uh, San Francisco. Um, this camera has some really interesting features. If I pull this like a bit off, if you can see this or not, but he has his name with an old green Dymo label on the inside. And if I hit it just right in the reflection, you can see it says Fusco Magnum. Well, Paul didn't join Magnum until uh, my understanding is 1974. Um, so this camera produced in, in 58, he was still on a big project in 68 when he joined Magnum in 74. So I, I don't know how long um, this camera was in use, if he was the first owner of it or not. Um, it's very possible he was. Uh, but this was acquired um, from his family 
probably yeah, seven or eight years ago. Um, so he uses his cameras very well. If you look at the top cover of it, um, you can see it's pretty heavily worn. One of the really cool things that you see on a lot of the Magnum cameras is this rapid rewind crank. And um, those uh, were quite common of that area among the professional photographers. Uh, this particular camera uh, has a 2828 on it with a 28 millimeter uh, finder. Um, and this, uh, this camera built in 58 was basically the first main production here at the M2 and it features the button rewind. So all the early cameras have this button here. And um, this was changed later on in the, in the production to lever rewind because it was easier for the lever to stay down during the rewind process where this button would, would pop back up as you're rewinding. So you really had to hold the button in during the entire time that you were doing the rewind sequence. Uh, so that's, that's the reason they changed that from the, uh, from the button to the lever rewind. Um, but uh, in 58, uh, they made about, was the biggest production year of this camera, they made about 15,000 units um, with the overall production of about 74,000 units compared to the M3, which was about over 200,000 units. So you know, the M2 is really, even though it was made during the same time frame as the M3, it's really a much less common camera. Um, any questions so far? I don't see anything yet, Sean. Okay, good. Oh, did you discuss the differences in finder between uh, the M3s and M2s of different eras? No, that's a good point. So the M3 is famous because it has the 0.95 magnification viewfinder for 50 millimeters. So everyone loves that camera because you put a 50 on it and it's basically full frame. Um, it also had frame lines for 90 and 135. For me, I like a 35 millimeter lens in addition to the 50. So this camera was the first camera to incorporate the 35 millimeter frame lines. Uh, so it's 35, 50, 70, or 35, 50, 90, and 135 on this guy. Um, the M2 was produced for about 10 years. Uh, towards the end of the production, uh, they, made, they had an M2R. So the M2R had the rapid load mechanism that, which they used in later M4s and M6s. And then that, uh, that rapid load system was developed for the uh, US Army. They asked for a faster loading mechanism uh, for the cameras. So uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in my next segment here. But um, another interesting piece that came to us from, from Mr. Fusco is this black enamel 35F2. Hold it right here for you. And you can see that very well or not, but that's that's a really rare piece. This was also produced in 1958, and um, you just don't see these around too much. Um, the very very first black enamel uh, 35 8 elements were were painted over chrome. Um, they really hadn't developed a procedure for for black painting items, and um, uh, according to some talks I've had with some other uh, collectors. These black paint lenses were ordered by Magnum early on, which follows with the uh, provenance of this particular piece required from Mr. Fusco. But if you notice the back of it, it's a brass mount. So these first lenses were actually built on a thread mount chassis, and then they had these basically mount adapters um, that they threaded onto that, and they were secured by a small set screw, if I can find it here. Right here on the mount. If I can catch that in the light, you can see that or not. But if you pull that set screw out, then this mount will actually remove and you have a, a full-on thread mount lens underneath. Um, this particular one has an infinity lock. Uh, the infinity lock on this one's been disabled. I'm, I'm sure that was probably special order or, or uh, something that was um, improved for Mr. Fusco at the factory. Um, so it wouldn't lock in the infinity so you could focus it more quickly. Um, these lenses, in this form are super rare. Um, don't really know how many exist or not. Um, I've run across less than 10 of these uh, before. There's, a, there's one popped up on eBay four or five months ago uh, that sold. I know F22 in Hong Kong's had a couple of these before and I've seen them pop up at auction at Westlook uh, once or twice, but they're all in the same serial number range, um, which is a, a 
early 1958 serial number range. And they're usually, when you see these lenses, they're all in a, about the same batch of about 50, 50 units. This one's a 1632014, and most of the black uh, lenses like this with the brass mounts are in the 1632 serial number range. Um, these early 35 uh, eight element lenses are really pretty lenses. Uh, it was the first super fast 35 millimeter lens ever produced. Um, it was very well received. And it had a production run of about the same run as the M2. It was produced mostly from 58 to 68. Um, um, in 69, they came out with a six element version of this uh, that uh, had a little bit higher contrast. Um, but really, if you look at all the 35s that were produced, this early eight element, it produces uh, an image of slightly less contrast and less color saturation. It, it center focuses, it's got a little bit of vignetting, but all those seemingly negative things add up to uh, a rendering, which is really pretty on these lenses. Um, but this came from uh, this came from Paul, and you can see it's also very well worn. Um, the black paint on these lenses didn't really hold up that well because it was on the chrome finish. It just didn't stick well to the to the black uh, the, or to the uh, chrome finish. So um, Leica worked on. Uh, different ways of developing a better uh, black painted surface. This is the only one where the full lens is black paint. Um, later versions, you would see some, some of the lenses partially painted, partially anodized. Um, I happen to have another copy of this lens here, which was made in 59. And this is an interesting lens. You don't see these very often either, but this is an eight element, which is full anodized. Um, this is factory um, finish. It's been in a collection probably since new. Uh, it looks pretty much unused. It does prominently display a made in Canada on the side. Um, of these eight element lenses, some were made in, in Germany, some were made in Canada. This, this other one, this black paint one, was made in, in Wetzlar um, in 58. This one in 59, made in Canada. I think that I see more of these made in Canada than not. As a rule, um, they all shoot the same. Uh, they're all they're all marvelous lenses, but this is um, this is as rare, I think, as the black paint version. Um, it just doesn't have uh, the aura and mystique of the old black enamel lenses. But you just don't see these anodized lenses very often. Um, a third version of this lens is the one everyone's used to seeing. And this is the regular eight element in chrome. Uh, this is a very late production piece. Uh, this one was made in 68. It's got a, a, a 2 million serial number. And uh, this is what you typically are going to find with these, with these lenses, these eight element lenses, is something like this. And if you find a nice one of these, you're gonna probably spend three to 4,000 on a really decent copy. Um, one thing you have to watch out for in these eight element lenses is that Leica used a high metallic content glass on one of the inner elements. And really it, this lens has the same problem as uh, the M9s do with the sensor corrosion. Um, the sensor corrosion problem on the M9 uh, came about because the cover glass on the M9 has a high metallic content in it as well. So when you clean the sensor, if you don't use the right cleaning fluid, it ate the the multi coatings off of the sensor and expose the raw glass, and then the metal in the glass would corrode, giving your sensor corrosion. So when you're looking at these lenses, you have to check them very thoroughly to make sure that the inner element next to the aperture isn't kind of a milky color. Sometimes that's haze, but a lot of times it's corrosion. The corrosion, there's not really a good way to repair that. Um, we're really lucky on these three copies because these are all nice and clean. When you find a nice one, they, the, the images really have a nice glow to them, and it's just a really pretty lens. Um, interesting thing on this particular lens is that this lens came out of a KS-15 set. Uh, going back to the M2 that we were looking at earlier, we talked about the M2R, and uh, uh, the M2R was actually an overrun from the military uh, KS-15, which was the uh, camera that was developed for the Army for the rapid load. And um, the KS-15 was supplied to the US Army in a case that looked like that. 
and that actually has the the depot markings on it and it's got the original hang tags from the from the army depot that had it and these kits were pretty cool because they were supplied with a 35 8 element a 50 dual range with goggles a 135 28 you had the m2 not marked r at the time but the m2r in there there was a there was a flash gun flash bulbs there were x new film cassettes there was a filter set for each one of the lenses, there was a cable release, there was a neck strap, there was a strap for the case, so it came just packed full of really cool goodies. And a lot of those goodies um, had special tags on them, like that, that's a cable release, and it's got the U.S. Army uh, information on it from, uh, from when it was issued. So another interesting bit of, uh, of Leica history, but if you look, if you have the opportunity, and not very many people do, and have the opportunity to compare these three lenses at the same time, and this is going to be really hard to show, but if I can do this without dropping anything, it's hard to see, but if you look at the front element at the multi-coating, they reflect very slightly different colors. And that tells me that the multi-coatings were changed on these three lenses during the production of the lenses themselves. So that's something that Leica commonly did is that they would produce a lens um, and they would run it for like this one, in this case, a period of 10 years, but along the process, they would make subtle changes and upgrades to the lens and they wouldn't tell anybody about it because they didn't want to reclassify the lens as a different version, that sort of thing. But all three of these, uh, same optical formula, same number of elements and the same number of groups, but the coatings are different. So they were trying to improve it probably the newer lens, this, uh, this one for the Army, it probably has um, harder multi-coatings. Um, the 50 dual range Sumicron for the US Army had a special front multi-coating on it, which was more impervious to scratches than the early ones. So I would assume that they probably applied that same multi-coating to this 35 as well. Um, uh, but there's gonna be more, more flare suppression, probably a little bit better contrast, a little bit uh, better color saturation. Um, to shoot all these three of these lenses side by side, I don't know that you'd be able to tell much of a difference with the different multi-coatings, but you might. Um, you might on digital, I don't think you could on film because there's just too much uh, translation done when you make a print from a negative, um, then maybe you wouldn't see on a color matched monitor at one time. But um, if you've never shot one of those 35 F2s, I highly recommend at least borrowing one, trying it out and, and seeing what you like. Um, for me, I like, uh, I like the modern lenses. So I've got a 35 F2, the, the current version. It's on the Normark. And I've got uh, this silver one is actually my lens that I've shot with quite a bit. Um, long been a favorite. Uh, any questions so far? All right, Sean, we, we have a few questions here. Um, actually, more than a few. Uh, going back to uh, Fusco's M2, um, was, that, was that camera, um, do, is there any photos of him with that camera or how did we, uh, how did, what was the provenance or I guess surrounding um, that link? That's a good question. Um, I don't have any photos of him with the camera. I did actually go online last night and look up some videos of the funeral train and some information about Paul just to see if I could locate anything um, that was out there uh, in the public with him using these cameras. Um, a big batch of his cameras came up for sale and they were sent to Austria to the big auction in, in Vienna, maybe three, four years ago. So if you go back to um, those listings on the, uh, on the Westlick auctions, you'll see several batches of his cameras and they're all just crazy worn down cameras. He had some black paint cameras where the paint is 80, 90% worn off of the camera that were, that were sold. There are some M4s in there, and some other M2s in there. It's a really interesting batch of cameras. So the, to me, this one's a survivor for, from one that didn't get sold at uh, a public, public auction. But, um, what happened is um, he gave a lot of his cameras away to his family members and then the family members sold the cameras. So we actually got this from his niece. She brought this in uh, with the 28 and the finder. She brought in this 35 F2. 
Um, also in that batch, there was a 90F2 Sumicron, and then there was a, a like of it um, in black paint that wasn't so heavily worn. And the reason I don't think it was as heavily worn because when we got it, it was broken. The chain drive was completely broken on the inside. So I don't know if you dropped it or, or what happened to it to cause the breakage. But to me, it looked like he used it not as hard as everything else. It broke, he set it aside, never used it again. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the like of it anymore, nor, nor do I have the 90 millimeter. Um, those got away from us before I really thought to start trying to preserve some of these um, interesting cameras that come in. Um, you know, this camera's, this camera's got a lot of mojo. This camera's seen a lot of interesting things. It's taken, I just can't imagine the kind of images that this thing's taken, but when you hold it, I mean, it's got his original neck strap on it. So it's, if I pull the, if I pull the finder off of it, you can see all the gunk stuffed up there in the, in the shoe and in here next to the, the shutter speed. We, when we acquired this thing, we didn't clean it up or anything. We just left it as we acquired it. So I think that, that to me makes it even more special. But um, we acquired it from a member of the family. Um, I've got a check written to the family member somewhere, copy that somewhere. So that would be, that's my provenance on it. Um, for me, I, I bought it because, uh, you know, Paul's a San Francisco resident. So he's kind of our, he's kind of like one of our local Magnum photographers. And I just thought it was important for us to retain something um, of his. So a, a lot of times I get really caught up in, in, the piece because it's a cool item. It's a it's a like of it with an M2. M2 is one of my favorite cameras. I always like them with the like of it, and it had a couple of cool lenses with it. So at the time you're doing all this, you're not really thinking about okay, in 10 years, how am I going to answer the question of how I came about this camera? You just buy it, and, and, and you know the story on it. You don't ever plan on selling it, and that's just how it kind of ends up. But that's uh, that's our story on acquiring this camera. Did you take, I, I might have missed it, but were you able to take the like of it off that and show what was underneath it? Yeah, I'll do it again. There might have been people that missed it. Just, Just in case of. you missed it, this is one of the coolest things on this like of it, but he put his green Dymo label in there. It says his name. If I hold it just in the right reflected light, you can see where he etched into it, Fusco Magnum. So that for me really dates this piece. So it's a 58 production. I know he used it in 68 because he told me he did. And I know he had it in 74 because that's when he joined Magnum. So I would guess maybe that in 74 when he joined Magnum, um, he might have etched this in, in there. Um, a lot of those guys would go into the offices and set their cameras down and have them in the dark rooms and stuff. So they would, they would label their cameras so that someone else didn't think it was theirs and pick it up and walk out with it. Um, it wasn't that anybody would take it intentionally, it's just that everyone's a bunch of Leicas laying around and you just kind of grab one and go shoot with it. Um, but, um, but yeah, that, that, that makes it special for me. Another odd thing about this like of it, it's actually missing a screw out of the end of it here. But uh, the black one that we bought from him was missing all the screws out of it. He might have tried to take it apart and repair it, I don't know, but we sent that to uh, Don Goldberg and he lovingly restored it for us and we gave it a new home after that. I'm sorry, my video didn't want to unmute there. A um, few questions. All that was extremely interesting. Going from Fusco's M2 um, over to more of the uh, 35 millimeter eight elements that we were talking about, you were talking about there. Um, you elaborated a little bit on the differences and the, the minute differences with the coatings and whatnot with each eight element, but is there any more that you could go into on the differences between a Canadian and a Vetzlar made um, uh, eight element? And is there any kind of rendering difference or quality difference on those? That's a really interesting thing because when I first got into the industry, which was back in the eighties when I was in college, um, they were still producing things in Canada. And that was always a big deal. You get people that would come in and say, okay, I, I want to buy a, such and such, but I don't want one that's made in Canada. They want one that's made in Germany because that's where Leica was established. 
and part of the problem with that is that some of these lenses were never made in Germany. They were only made in Canada, like the 50 F1, the first F1s. Those were all made in Canada by um, uh, Walter Mandler, who designed that. So the Canadian factory was established, obviously, after World War II. Um, World War II definitely disrupted the production of, of Leica's factory. And they were looking for some way to ensure the continuation of, of building products. So they, they talked about establishing a factory on a neutral soil. Um, uh, so it was chosen to put a factory in Canada because it was a relatively neutral country. Um, they wanted to put it close to a waterway for shipping and they sent some, some people over there and they looked at some areas and they uh, decided to produce these uh, products in, in Midland, in Midland, Ontario. And that's really the only reason that that was established as another factory, just in case there was some unrest in Germany again, they could always rely on uh, another place that could continue producing items where maybe Germany couldn't. But to establish that factory, um, a lot of Germans went over there. They sent a lot of uh, parts over there because the first cameras that were produced over there were produced from parts made in Germany and they were just assembled in Canada. And eventually they sent uh, manufacturing hardware over to actually produce the parts. So a lot of things were made from scratch in Canada. Um, but they used the same German machinery. Most of the people who worked in the factory were Germans, the same German designers. It, it's literally just a different address for the production of, of the units. So when you compare a Wetzlar lens to a Canadian lens, unless you look at the lens, um, you don't know which one's which. There's, they're really impossible to tell apart. They're built exactly the same. So you'd say basically the variance in, in like the, the coatings and, and the, the slight differences between some of these lenses are more along the lines of an, an era rather than a location of production. Definitely, definitely. If you look at um, these early lenses, the 58s and 59s, they're, they're really similar. And then as you get to the late ones, you can tell some coatings changed. But if you, if you were fortunate enough to get a Canadian and a Vetslar lens, you know, maybe made in 60, 61, 62, and look at them side by side, um, other than the trim ring that says lights can or lights Betzlar, you cannot tell a difference in them. The, the manufacturing processes were identical at the time. Um, uh, the rare earth elements they used for the glass was the same and, and, the, and the minerals that they used to do the multi-coating, it's all the same stuff. It's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, just kind of bumping around on the different questions that are coming through here. Um, one question we had going back to uh, when you were talking about the M2R, or sorry, the M2, and M2R would be a, a variant of that, but uh, you talked about the military purchase of different Leica cameras and lenses. Was that a common occurrence with Leica or um, what, what makes some of those uh, variants so special? Well, Leica did produce a lot of cameras for, for the military, I and mean, they were a preeminent camera manufacturer um, of that era as they are now. So it really wouldn't be any different than any government facility saying, we want to have the best tools to do this type of photography that we want to do for you know, whatever it is, whatever effort that they were going for at the time. So, you know, in that era, back in the 30s and 40s, um, during the World War II era, um, Leica supplied, even though they're from Germany, they supplied cameras to the German Armed Forces, the British Armed Forces, and the US Armed Forces at the time. So uh, they were really a supplier to anybody who, any likely customer who wanted to buy the cameras. Um, where it gets really interesting is when you start seeing the different variances, maybe one, um, armed services, they wanted something a little bit different. They wanted something more customized towards their, towards their needs. Um, you look at um, uh, the, I think the, uh, there was a gray M2 that was produced for the United States where they only made about 20 pieces. So that, that was a special order for a military branch that was really interesting. You look at um, from the, you know, the 50s and 60s, the Bundeswehr, 
Um, the, the German armed forces would order cameras. They ordered them an olive green finish. And that's a really popular finish today because we have all the safari cameras and the safari lenses, um, which we do have a few in stock right now of this new Safari 90 F2s so that just came in last week. Um, but you know that's where that all came about with the uh, with the green painted cameras. Um, during the war, uh, World War II, you saw a lot of three Cs in the gray painted finish. And the reason they used the gray painted finish on the three Cs, uh, because chromium, what they used to plate their cameras with, was in really high demand for, for gun barrels. They wanted to chrome plate the gun barrels so they wouldn't rust. And the chromium as a material was in such high demand for the war effort that they, they couldn't use it to produce cameras with, so they just gray painted the cameras. So that's what the origin of uh, the gray paint cameras were. But to a, to a great degree other than some specialized finishes, most of the cameras were pretty much the same as, as the production cameras. Um, in the case of the M2R, they asked for a, a rapid load system. Um, they had a rapid load system for the M3 and the M2, which, which was simply a different take-up spool with a slot in it. And then they had a little pusher um, that attached to the base plate, which pushed the film into place when you attached the uh, film uh, base to the camera. And that was an upgrade accessory you could add to an M2 or M3, but the uh, Army was looking for something um, more reliable, more dependable, because that, you know, it was an easier to load system, but it wasn't super easy to load as, as the current loading system is. Um, and they built a few hundred of those for the armed services and then the, the army canceled the contract and the overrun, which is just a few hundred pieces, uh, was sold to the public as the M2R. Were the, uh, one question we just got in that I think kind of pertains to this is interesting because many of us still shoot and use some of these cameras, um, these vintage M2s, M3s and whatnot. Um, is the Wetzlar factory still servicing those or is there a better solution for that? Um, Vetzlar Factory is still servicing them, and I, it's not public knowledge. I'm not sure that it's supposed to be public knowledge, so if I release some secrets, sorry. But they've actually, the last time we were over there, which was a year or so ago in June, they were actually working on a special department within the repair department. And, and the repair department is, if you've never been to the factory, it's crazy. It's huge. It's like a football field uh, where, they, where they do this stuff, and it's super clean, super organized, and, and it's, it's really just an amazing uh, service center. They've got that thing to where it's like a little miniature hospital. But they've got a, a department within the department that does special stuff for vintage cameras. And they've got some of the original tooling that they use to produce these original pieces like top covers and, and lens barrels and things like that. They've actually got lathes and milling machines set up to where if you send your vintage piece in, they don't have the part, then there's maybe an option of recreating the part or, or doing something more extensive uh, to get your vintage pieces back in action. Um, it's really expensive. Um, I sent uh, an original 51.4 Sumalux back uh, because it wasn't, uh, I, the, the helicoid just, it was basically worn out or shot. And um, they cleaned the glass, they recoded one of the elements and fixed my helicoid. It was about $1,000, but it came back and it's perfect and I still have the lens. But they do some special work there back at the factory. Um, it's on special request, it's not really publicized, but, um, and then there's some really good, there's some really good people here in the US to do stuff as well. So you just about everything like as ever made can be serviced. That's pretty uh, pretty interesting, especially seeing that these 50 and 60 year old cameras can most certainly be run and used today. Um, is there a key difference or a reason? Uh, I guess this question would be kind of twofold. Is there a key difference between uh, choosing an M2 over an M3 uh, for use nowadays, or is there maybe a value proposition there um, that might be had? What, what, what would your thoughts be on that if you're recommending one? Um, I really would think about it backwards. Think about what lens you want to use and what focal length you like the best. Um, I like the option of a 35 without using an external viewfinder. So naturally an M2 is nice for me. If you're someone who only shoots 50, then you might like to have the M3. I don't think tangibly there's a big enough difference between the two to say you should definitely go one way or the other. It's really a choice of options for the two cameras, which one best suits your needs. But 
from a value perspective, the M2 should be more expensive because they made so many less pieces, but really, you know, average condition, well-serviced M2 or M3 still sells for about a grand right now. Um, you know, ugly beat up ones that still work eight, $900. And, and as you get nice ones, if you get one, maybe 90% condition, maybe $1,200 mint one 2000 to 3000 depends if it's got boxes and that kind of stuff with it so they can they can really go up in price but they all do the same thing uh they all work well once you get it surfaced it's it's probably going to work for another 20 or 30 years without being service again uh going along with that is there is there a specific way um or is is it even a good idea to fit an mp finder um, to an M2 or M3, or is that even possible? I think probably with a lot of the talent that we have out there today with, with, with guys who can work on these cameras outside of the factory, I think probably just about anything is possible. Whether you should do it or not, it's a different story. It's like taking, I don't know, it's like taking an old Ferrari and putting a modern Ferrari engine in it. It's like you could, but why would you want to? Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't do it for an M3 because I think that the big thing on the M3 is to have a, that 50 millimeter viewfinder in there. For an M2, I don't think it's as much of a uh, uh, of an abomination. I've seen M4 finders and M2s before. You pick up an M2 and you see a 75 millimeter frame line in it. Frame line in it, you go, wait a minute, that's not supposed to be here. You don't notice it initially, but after a minute of playing around with it, you say, hey, this is this is not supposed to be here. What's going on? And you look at some more and you see the finder's different. So. I think almost everything you can imagine to be done has been already been done once or twice before. You're kind of going along with that. And this is something we've discussed here in the store. I think we've, we might've had it done once or twice. I can't remember. Um, but uh, vintage lenses, uh, can they be, uh, can you speak on how they might be uh, recoded um, by Vetzlar? Um, well, that's kind of a new thing. And when I sent my 50 millimeter in, that was a, probably about three years ago, right after they started doing the service. And I don't know if they actually had a vintage element on hand where they sort of swapped the element out or they recoated it. But I mean, it is the factory. They're set up to do every single thing you can possibly do to a lens from, from start to finish. So it, it's more about whether or not they're set up for it, whether they've got the people on hand that are skilled to do that sort of thing and, and whether it you know, just makes economic sense to take someone off of one thing to do another. But they're set up to be able to do pretty much everything. And, and if you've got a lens, a vintage lens that you want to have recoated, we have a contact who is our representative uh, at the Vetzlar factory for service. We can always reach out to, to them uh, with your lens and your show number of your lens and, and the problem and, and get, um, get some advice from them whether or not to forward it on. Uh, I would think you've got at least a 50% chance of them saying, let's go ahead and send it over. As long as money's no object, I think it's probably possible. But is it a good idea? That is the question. Because <laughs> that uh, would take yeah. the rendering of the lens most likely if they, if they were theoretically to do that. Um, my 50 millimeter looks like it's got vintage coatings in it. So uh, it doesn't look like they put modern multi coatings in it. It looks just like it did when I said it's done. It's just not cloudy anymore. So that would be a good thing to find out. We can certainly ask. Um, we had planned a factory trip um, for June um, to go back, take a group of people back to the factory and visit. And uh, in the factory tour, we would have visited the repair department and you could have met people in charge of the repair department ask these questions if you want to go. Um, we did postpone our trip. We're probably gonna postpone it until next summer just so we have plenty of room to get, uh, get through this uh, health risk that we're going through right now. So I think we're going to probably relaunch that trip for next June. But um, I had a camera that uh, I was planning on taking with me to um, have some in-person advice on uh, about getting it uh, upgraded. So uh, that, that's an option. We can certainly make inquiries today to see if anything can be done and to what extent they would do it. But uh, we I really haven't had enough experience with that, that segment of their department to really um, 
really say how they're proceeding with repairs like that. Couple questions, uh, outlier questions that would be uh, interesting. We've got one here. Um, would a have you ever seen a three G produced with a bayonet mount from nineteen fifty seven? Seems like a very specific question. Uh, I've not ever seen one in person. If you look at um, some of Jim Logger's books, um, he's notorious. Um, like an enthusiast who has compiled a, a three volume library of cool like a history and, and interesting prototypes, but he does have one in there. Um, I have to go back and look at my reference material, but I think maybe that might have been prototyped by Don Goldberg's father um, at one time, might have been done through Camcraft. Um, I don't remember for sure, but I do know that in, in Jim Logger's book, he does show a, a bayonet mount 3G. At, uh, I don't think it ever went into production. I don't know uh, if prototypes still exist or not. Uh, keeping with uh, some of the uh, questions concerning the differences in, in uh, Leica M bodies, uh, we had a question here uh, regarding the differences. Maybe this is broadening out too much, but we'll take questions uh, that are that are much broader than what we're discussing. And I think this is good. We might have to do uh, another one of these in order to cover um, more bases and more specific topics. Um, but differences uh, between like an M2, M3, and they later, later came out with an M5. Um, what would be the differences? Do you, could you go into some detail as to why they did that? Um, or why they changed a little bit when they, when they moved to an M5? And uh, if someone were, looking at those three cameras today, what, what might sway their choices there? Well, if you're not sure, I say buy all three, absolutely. I mean, that's my, that's my best advice right up front um, because they're all a little bit different. They all have a little bit different characteristics when you're holding them, when you're using them. You know, the M3, there's two major variations of the M3. There's, there's I, I've been told by some of the repair guys, there's as many as possibly a, a hundred revisions on the M3. Uh, mostly internal, you know, externally, we can see that we had the double stroke and then the single stroke and then the, the speed sequence changed and the lugs changed and the, some of the controls went from larger controls to smaller controls and the ISO dial changed in the back. But internally, I, I'm told that there are just massive uh, variances of changes along the way. Um, the M2 they had the button rewind and that changed to the lever rewind. They had them with self timer, without self timer. So the last ones are gonna be lever wind with self timers. So there's, there's little differences in all those. And the main difference is in the finder. The, the M3's got the 50, 90, 135. The M2's got 35, 50, 90, and 135 on the finders. Um, so to me, that's, that's the, the biggest difference of those two. The, both of those cameras take that like a bit rapid wind attachments. If you can find one of these, both of the M2 and the M3 take these things. Um, you might have to have the camera slightly adjusted to work with that um, uh, device, which is not a, a big deal. There's a couple guys here in the US that do those things. When they went to the M5, that was the first camera with a built-in electronic meter. Um, they changed some things on, on the camera. Um, they had a two lug version, which had the strap lugs both at one end. so the, camera hung vertically. Um, it was a little bit bigger chassis, so they, I think they thought it hung vertically, um, that it would minimize the, the size difference of the body. Um, but it actually had an analog needle meter in it, kind of like a Gossel Lunar Pro, just miniaturized and kind of stuffed into the camera. Um, it was a very accurate light meter. It worked very well. Um, the M2 was, a, it's a wonderful tool. It wasn't widely accepted because like a digressed uh, from their standard body size to a different body size. So a lot of people complained about that, but it did have a rapid rewind crank built into the base of the, of the camera, which was, which was unique um, and some other unique features. It's, it's really the most different M body of all the M bodies ever produced. And it's, it's, they're nice cameras. It's, it's tough to find them with working light meters. Um, the battery contacts, people would leave the batteries in them for too long and the batteries would corrode. 
and then the corrosion would weaken the primary battery contact and then that would break off and then you have no more uh, light metering capacity. Um, those battery compartments uh, are no longer produced. Um, there's a few repair guys who have um, scrolled some away. You might find someone with an extra battery compartment to revive one of those cameras. But at this particular point, uh, for the cameras that don't have good battery compartments, we're just kind of waiting on someone um, to independently put that part back into production and revise some of those cameras. But they're great cameras, even without working meters. Um, they're fun to use. I think we'll have to uh, possibly go into more depth on the differences and uh, minute differences on M cameras. Uh, it might be another show. <laughs> I think that one, that one and uh, we do have a request here to go into some R, uh, like R uh, uh, items as well. I think we have some interesting things that we could dig out and talk about with uh, like R in a future webinar. So we'll, we will most certainly keep that in mind. Um, I believe that answers most of the questions for today. Um, there is a question about uh, a 50 millimeter 1.2 Noctilux. Um, you wouldn't happen to know, is, is Leica currently working on those uh, at the factory or uh, are they not touching those at the factory because of their kind of fragile nature? Well, they are very fragile and, and there's no parts available for them. But um, if you've got one that needs to be serviced, um, shoot me over an email with the serial number on it. I'll inquire to our service agent over there in Germany, providing that they're, I don't think they're back in the office till after the seventh, they're closed right now, but we can shoot a note over to them and see about getting it serviced. Um, I have my independent guys here in the US, I've sent them out to be cleaned before and they've had pretty good success in that. I've, I've not really ever had one that was so bad that couldn't be cleaned locally where I had felt like I had to send it to Germany. But, um, uh, we did have one with a damaged lens mount on it once and we had to have that repaired, but I mean, pretty much everything's repairable. Um, uh, back to the R thing, um, uh, we are still, even though we're closed, our storefronts closed, we are still taking lots and lots of trade-ins, uh, websites updated daily, but I've got a, I have a nice collection of R stuff coming in on trade tomorrow. And I th think Friday I've got an R9 with the digital back coming in, which you don't see those very much anymore. Uh, you know, not a lot of megapixels from the era, but it uses the old CCD sensors. They make wonderful images and uh, they're just fun to use, but you can pick those up fairly economically compared to what they cost when they were new. Um, but watch for that on the website. That should be up by, hopefully by the end of the week with some interesting R lenses. But uh, we're always, we get stuff in new here every single day. And our challenge a lot of times is, I'm, we might have as many as a hundred pieces backlog. It's just, getting time to sit down with each piece, uh, cleaning it up, um, maybe doing some minor restoration on it uh, and, and getting it ready. Maybe it needs to be serviced. We have to get sent out and find someone who is available to work on it, who has the expertise to do the work on it and get it out and back. But uh, everything that we have um, gets cleaned. It gets checked when it comes in. It gets double checked again before it goes on display. We photograph it, we write a description for it and it hits our website. So there's a lot of behind the scenes work that's done uh, to get these things ready to present to you guys. Um, so if you're ever looking for anything, don't hesitate to shoot us an email. There's probably there's all kinds of stuff sitting in the back all the time. It's pending, pending uh, hitting the website. But um, we, we are, I'm getting boxes in every single day with cool stuff in them. So if you're thinking about doing a trade, don't hesitate to ask. Excellent. Uh, if you have any more questions, I send them over now, but I think that pretty much covers everything. Um, someone said that the, uh, they have seen a M2R uh, instruction booklet and a regular M2 instruction booklet, and they're drastically different due to the rapid load mechanism in the M2Rs. Interesting, someone that we know uh, quite well. Yeah, I might have some M2R instruction, and I'm just laying around if anybody needs them. <laughs> we do have a few of those, actually. 
Um, maybe we'll have to scan those and put them up on the Camera West blog uh, here shortly, which by the way, yeah. um, we are recording this session and I'm going to go ahead and post that on our Camera West blog. So that's camera west forward slash blog. Um, we'll also go ahead and post some images of the three Sumer, uh, Sumicron lenses, eight element lenses that uh, Sean was talking about and uh, some uh, images of the Fusco camera as well. So you can get a little bit more detail, look at those. Um, I know that just holding it up to the camera doesn't quite, doesn't quite get you all the details and, and little nuances that you can see on these, on these items. And they're, at least to us, uh, being a little nerdy about it, uh, they're, they're, they're quite fascinating pieces. So uh, we like to show them off and talk about them and, and uh, share that with you. So we will do that. A um, couple more questions coming in here. Give me a second here to uh, take these in. Um, uh, Andrew has a question about repairs. Actually, I handle a lot of the repairs here. So the uh, uh, we do send some of our, if I understand your question correctly, we do send some vintage uh, pieces off to third party repair facilities. Uh, we work with quite a few of them, as Sean mentioned. And uh, if you have something, uh, Andrew, you've actually got my email. So shoot me an email. We'll figure that out for you. Um, and uh, someone else has a question about the evolution of the Noctilux. I know our good friend Mark uh, DePaula had a very good uh, webinar earlier with Leica about this, but we might need to uh, revisit that um, in a new webinar um, as we're running out a little bit of time. And that is a huge topic to get into the differences between the 1.2, the couple versions of the 1.0, the modern 0.95, and then we have the 75 Noctilux as well. Um, we might need to uh, address that in another webinar. Um, and speaking of that, we do have all of our uh, upcoming webinars on the Camera West website, camerawest.com forward slash events. Um, we have one later this week um, with our good friend Blake Griffin over at Capture One. He's going to talk about, uh, give us a little bit of an intro as to the benefits of Capture One editing and that side of the software. Um, so that's going to be a very exciting one uh, we're looking forward to with him, at least myself, being a, a big Lightroom user over the past several years. That's going to be very informative, at least for me, uh, since I've switched over to Capture One in the past few weeks. So that will be interesting. Um, we also have a few more with Fujifilm uh, concerning the X-T4 and that upcoming um, shipment of that camera. Uh, we have a very interesting one with Ray Olson concerning the new Leica S3 medium format camera, which I'm sure um, all of us are interested to learn more about, and uh, a few others. So be sure to take a look at our um, take a look at our event site on the Camera West website and uh, sign up for any of those. Now we actually ran out of spots for this session over the weekend and we just announced it, I think that was Tuesday. So this session booked up in just a couple days. So if you wanna get into those live, um, go ahead and sign up now uh, so you can re reserve your spot. Otherwise we might run out. We're limiting all of these to about uh, to 100 participants uh, just so we can get through all the questions and everything without uh, leaving uh, too many people out hanging, too many questions out hanging. Um, because I'm sure we'll get a lot of them in the sessions to come. Um, as uh, Sean and I mentioned, uh, we do want to connect with you, be here to help you in any way possible. Um, so send us an email, Sean at Camera West or Ben at CameraWest.com. We're happy to help you in any way we can. Um, also, we are still still putting inventory, pre-owned inventory up on our website. So uh, camerawest.com um, and you can look at the pre-owned inventory. If you click at the top, it will actually take you to all of our recent listings. So we're constantly keeping that updated. And uh, if you need anything else, we are, um, you're able to call the store here in Ranch and Mirage. There's usually someone here, at least one person in the office during normal weekday hours, which is 10 till 
six, uh, you can give us a call, um, which you can find the information on our website, but 760-992-5422. Um, yeah, I think that wraps it up for today. Uh, we hope to see you next Thursday um, for our Capture One session, same time. Uh, go ahead and sign up on our website and we'll see you then. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everybody.